FBI at an, and NIH, I don't think we overlapped, Matt, you know, John. I was at NIH and NIH, NIH FBI at one point. Please give us the date. So maybe uh, me, uh, if we cross I, paths. I think we I'm missed sorry. each other. I was there yeah. between 2012 and 2015. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you for joining us as a uh, as a seminar speaker, and will be a, hopefully an eye opening experience to uh, hear uh, the latest developments on this uh, exciting technology of cell cell therapy and your uh, experience with both at the science of it and also translational side and Cartesian uh, the company and what you guys planning. Uh, to do in the next phases, hopefully in US and also some maybe insights on Turkey. Thank you. So the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Engiz Ojam, for the nice introduction. This is really an honor to speak to uh, the Bodic University faculty and whoever from outside the university is listening to this. Um, so today, I'd like to review uh, this technology called CAR T-cells. I believe a lot of people may have already heard about this as a cutting edge technology in oncology, in treating cancer. And um, But the technology is very complex and it's not like your typical drugs that you just swallow a pill and it works kind of a thing. So um, I wanted to take this opportunity to get, get into the details of the technology. And toward the end, I will summarize what we do at uh, Cartesian and what we plan to do as, as Genghis Anujam um, uh, suggested. So um, to do this, let me just share my slides with you. Um, so that it will be a little clearer. Okay, I call this uh, the first success story of engineered cell therapies. And what I mean by engineered cell therapies are live cell products. So these drugs are actually live cells that are engineered um, inside the lab, outside the body and given back to the body. So it's kind of like, sounds like a Star Wars technology kind of a thing, but it is now true with there are approved therapies. And, and one of the leading uh, class of these therapies is called CAR T cells. Um, back as now 2013, so almost 10 years ago, this little article came up in some small journal in Pennsylvania saying that the scientists at UPEN, uh, led by Carl June, maybe found a key way to fight cancer. Um, and that was because a patient um, who was refractory, leukemia patient, so a blood cancer patient who was very refractory to standard of care treatment, had just this amazing response and continued to live years after the treatment. And it was just a one-shot treatment that just basically cured the disease for this person who was refractory all other treatments. And it was just an eye-opener for people to say, wow, what a new and uh, interesting technology is coming up. Fast forward. Um, so these technologies are now, there are six of them. Uh, we'll see that a little bit more detail in the next slide. And already a big articles uh, published in New England Journal and Journal of uh, Clinical Oncology are coming up. Uh, showing that in, in cancer populations, when these products are tried in the uh, cancer patients in, uh, in the phase one, two trials, and uh, the ones that are tried early are the anti-CD19 CAR T therapies. All these acronyms will make a lot more sense, hopefully at the end of the seminar, so just bear with me. But anti-CD19 CAR T therapies, the first technologies showed incredible responses in patients who are basically resistant to all treatments that were available at the time. And I'm talking about only five, six years ago. So pretty much all the new recently developed treatments. And, um, and uh, some patients living uh, years after the treatment with this one-shot treatment, and, it's, and in the case of lymphoma, for example, more than actually 50% of the patients living five years after the treatment, which in oncological terms is usually uh, consistent with calling it a cure. Um, so it was, it was very exciting, and this is can we make it better. So today, um, there are six FDA-approved CAR T-cell treatments. Um, either they are CD19 CAR T-cell category or BCMA CAR T-cell category. Approval started in 2016 and uh, 2017, and just one after the other came in 2022 was the latest one with the sixth uh, CAR T being approved. So what are these CD19 CAR T or BCMA CAR T? What are these acronyms mean? So now let's get getting into the details of the technology. And let's start with the 
the letter T at the end of this uh, technology, the T part of the CD19 CAR T. So um, back to immunology 101, uh, the T cells are actually part of our lymphocytes. So it all starts from, as you know, from a hematopoietic blood stem cell. These are the stem cells that are collected from the umbilical cord when, for example, you have a baby so that it can make the whole immune system again in the future if you want to. So it's that stem cell that makes the myeloid and lymphoid cells. The myeloid cells get into all the other cells but lymphocytes, like our red blood cells, our platelets, um, or all the what's called innate immune system cells like neutrophils and eosinophils. These are, these are all older evolved, if you will, um, um, uh, cells in our body. And the more newly evolved cells are the lymphoid stem cell lineage, which are at the end are called T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, NK cells. And there's actually many more. This is a very oversimplified uh, uh, um, a de demonstration of all the cell lineages. But the T cells basically belong to a category of blood cells under white blood cells, under lymphocytes. And um, to make this immunity, to the adaptive immunity, innate immunity, to understand these terminologies, um, this is a, a graphic demonstration of the major cell types that are involved in the immune system. And uh, the term innate immunity means those are the cells, again, that are evolved earlier uh, uh, through the evolution of life. So they are more mean, more aggressive, and they are the ones that first make the fight. Uh, whereas the adaptive immunity evolved later in the evolution of life, where they are a lot more fine-tuned, can go after a target a lot more specifically without ca with causing much less toxicity. Uh, whereas with the innate immune system, it is more like an atomic bomb. If they go off, they can be very toxic. Um, so uh, adaptive immunity basically is the main immune Part of our main part of our immune system that specifically goes after the cancer cells and tries to eliminate them in our body. And therefore, everybody in the scientific world for the past 20 years, since it became clear that T cells are really important in killing cancer, um, everybody started to figure out how can we make that work better? How can we get these T cells that we already have in our body that has the potential to kill a tumor cell directly and through mechanisms that won't get resistant like chemotherapy, you know, it, it, the cells get resistant to chemotherapy, evolutionarily, they should not be getting resistant to this type of killing. How can we make that work better? And uh, everybody focused on uh, activating T cells for the uh, purpose of treating cancer. So before the CAR T cells, there was already proof of this concept that if you activate T cells, you can actually get rid of the cancer. And that concept was uh, first shown by a class of therapy called checkpoint inhibitors. So these are actually antibodies. These are not cells. So this is before the cell era, um, meaning still, I mean, they're 20 uh, year old drugs. They're not that old, but, uh, and the approvals are in the past five, six years. So they're actually pretty class, new class of agents that are now called immunotherapy. Uh, so these checkpoint inhibitors target a certain protein on the T cell, which is called PD-1, or on the tumor cell, which is called PDL one And these, the interaction between these two proteins is how the tumor stops the T cell from killing itself. It is one of those very unique resistance mechanisms that they developed, if you will, that it was figured it out. And as soon as it was figured it out, uh, antibodies were made to stop that. And voila, people were seeing with these uh, treatments that are now uh, approved and known as Keytruda, Optiva, Tetcentric, there's many class of approved treatments now that work incredible in certain types of tumors. And what type of tumors those are, are ones that have high mutation capacity. What I mean by that is their genome is has high amount of mutations. And that makes a lot of sense from immunotherapy because a lot of mutations means those cancer cells now look a lot more different than your normal cells because they have so many mutations in their genome, which that makes your immune system work a little bit better. And with agents that can activate your immune system, patients who have these high tumor burdens 
uh, mutation burdens get really incredible responses as shown in these graphs uh, published also in several big journals uh, with people more than 50% responding in say, staying in basically cure if they have a high tumor, tumor mutation burden. So the proof of concept that T cells can kill cancer cells was already there even before the CAR T cells. So um, the, excuse me, the categories of adaptive cell therapies that came along in the past 10 years can be put into four major categories. So the first one is the dendritic cell vaccines. Actually, this one, the one that came a little earlier than even the T cells. And the dendritic cells are the cells actually it was in the previous slide where they were feeding the T cell to train the T cell to kill the tumor. So they are one of those cells that helped the T cell to recognize the tumor. Um, so people knew a lot about that because of vaccines, basically. And this is how vaccines work in general, that they go to dendritic cells. And this is how our T cells get, when you get the COVID-19 vaccine, basically your dendritic cells are at work. Um, so people made it where now they can put tumor antigens into dendritic cells and hope that basically pe uh, people will get vaccinated against the cancer. And there's actually a drug that I got approved by FDA based on that called Provenge. And um, it was, it's, it's been more than 10 years. So it's been around for, for some time. And uh, the, although the idea sounds great, the uh, improved in overall survival, but this drug was still not that extensive. It was a few months and that's why it didn't become too hot, but at least it laid the pathway to now tell the world that you can get actually live cells. So in this case, dendritic cells, engineer them outside the lab from someone like individually from each cancer patient, engineer them outside the lab and give it back. And again, this was done more than 10 years ago at this point. Um, that paving the way now started to develop a lot more sophisticated technologies. Uh, one of the actually older ones that are again called tumor infiltrating lymphocyte or TILS. These are actually not engineered. So these are uh, the, 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 this is usually developed by surgeons, and actually the, the most famous surgeon who, who's really uh, pioneered this technology is Dr. Steve Rosenberg in NIH um, that I had the pleasure work, uh, to, work, to work with. And the idea was the tumor already has the T cells that can fight the cancer. That's why they are there. So why don't I take the tumor out, take the T cells out of it in the lab, activate them, just make them really more aggressive and give them back to the body. And that should just by itself work. And that's been done many, many times. And actually, there are some incredible, some rare cases that made its way to journals like Science and stuff, uh, because it was so uh, novel and interesting when it first came out. Uh, so some people responded incredibly, but still nobody in controlled trials, nobody really has shown a big benefit of them yet. And that's why you don't have any non approved treatments, although there may be a few coming up in the next few years. Um, so CAR T cells, which will be the topic of today, that will deepen more and uh, dig into more. And as I said, there are already six approved therapies because the technology works really amazing. And uh, TCR engineered cells, now these are the newest uh, category that is added to adaptive cell therapies. And these cells are still T cells, uh, just like CAR T cells. But the, uh, these cells, the, instead of engineering with CAR, which we're going to learn a little more, this really involves highly sophisticated genomic sequencing of tumor from each patient. So you, it, this, is, this is an immense project just to sequence each tumor to its, uh, to its very deep level so that they can figure out for that patient, what are the T cells that we specifically can find and go after? So it is really fine tuning and trying to dig and find that one T cell that people have that can fight that cancer and expand it. It is really an incredible technology, again, published in journals like Science, but it is very new, incredibly expensive and only in clinical trials. So uh, there's years to come before TCR engineered cells become um, a standard of therapy. Okay, so with that now, let's dig into CAR T cell um, science just a little more. So why is it so powerful? It is powerful because this, as we said, T cells are can normally can kill the cancer cell. So why do we have cancer? Because this T cell activation is very complex, which means a lot of things need to go right for it to work really well. Now, most of the time it works really well. That's why we all have cancer cells in our body that gets eliminated. But for the patient who gets cancer, obviously that's not working because something in this complex interaction is not going right and, and the T cell cannot recognize the tumor. So as you can see, there are many, many proteins. And this is a very oversimplified uh, schematic, schematic representation of how a T cell interacts with a, a tumor cell. And so there's many more proteins. So all this can be bypassed by the CAR T cell into just one interaction, which is between the target 
protein that is on the tumor cell versus the CAR protein or chimeric antigen receptor protein that is on the T cell. That's the whole interaction. That complex interaction comes down to interaction between these two proteins only. So it makes it a lot more simple, which is probably the re main reason why it's really powerful. This chimeric antigen receptor, which is a protein, which means it, it can be, it would be coming from an mRNA, which would come from a DNA, right? So people engineer these uh, chimeric antigen receptors nowadays, all, all those six input therapies using a DNA vector. So the DNA can code the chimeric antigen receptor protein that gets integrated into the T cells of each individual patient. That's the tough part. So to make it clear, cells are collected from the patient in a lab, this DNA vectors are inserted into the cells and these cells are kept live, happy and healthy and given back to the patient. And that's, that's the essence of the technology. So what is this chimeric antigen receptor protein that is so special? It is actually made, again, from uh, in a way where uh, we hybrid, we put hybrids of two naturally appearing proteins. So it is called chimera. So it is actually an antibody. The antibodies that we all know that go and bind to viruses, bacteria, cancer, the thing that needs to be recognized and killed, basically. So those antibodies, uh, part of the chimeric antigen receptor is a part of the antibody that specifically recognizes a target antigen. The power of the antibody is that it can literally go after a single protein type and do not touch the millions and billions of other proteins that you have in your body. So it can make the, uh, the, the treatment go incredibly specifically to a target. And this is why it's used extensively in, in generally, antibodies are used extensively in medicine to target a lot of different uh, antigens. So uh, the part of it, single chain variable fragment, but is what makes half of the chimeric antigen receptor. The other half, uh, which is the intracellular domain, uh, starts with a transmembrane domain. So this is the protein that anchors it into the cell membrane. So as you can see in the figure, half of the, the single chain variable fragment is sticking outside the cell so that it can recognize the outside target, the tumor antigen target, whereas the transmembrane domain anchors it into the cell membrane. So there's that little piece sticking inside the cell, which makes the cell to get activated or gives a signaling to the cell. And how does that do that? It does that through two proteins. One is called the CD3 Zeta or CD3 domain in general. This is a protein in the T cells that are just basically the heart of the whole T cell activation um, um, protein. The other one, excuse me again, is called a cold stimulatory domain. So this is the CD3 by itself basically can, is, not to, uh, is not enough to work. And this was figured out by basically the first generation of CAR T cells only had the CD3. They tried it in clinical trials and it worked little. Then they put the co-stimulatory domain, which is again in nature, that's how it works. CD3 always interacts with the co-stimulatory domain. So when they were able to replicate the nature a little better, Voila, it worked a lot better. So all the CAR Ts now have this co-stimulatory domain that makes the T cell get activated even more so that the killing is better. And the power of the CAR T cells is that you give this one shot and then one of the earlier patients who were treated, nine years later, they can still see this CAR protein because it's a man-made protein, if you will. You can really selectively keep tracking it inside the body to see how long does this technology live in my body? Because it's more my cells, but there is this weird protein that is on it. And the answer is after nine years, they can, people can still detect these things in, not of course, in every patient, patients who's basically survived all, all the way to this, but just gives you, tells you that if we can make this right, then people can technically get one shot of treatment and just get cured of their cancer. Okay, so that was the T cell part, which is the live cell part, which is really the one of the cores of the technology. The other part is the target. So the, why the acronym CD19 basically, or BCMA, where does that come from? So that's the target antigen. And why that is so unique or important is that for this technology to work, because it goes, as we said, using the single chain variable fragment or the antibody to go after a certain target protein or a very specific target protein, uh, which means that target protein needs to be only on the cancer cell and not on a normal cell. Because if it's on a normal cell, then it will also go and kill that one. Uh, so CD19 is a protein that is exclusively expressed on B cells, 
starting from very early stages of B-cell development. So this is why in all types of B-cell cancers, which is leukemias, lymphomas, basically, uh, CD19 is expressed. And there are and uh, there are drugs actually that go after this as a drug uh, because it's so uniquely expressed in the B cell and, and thereby their cancers, and BCMA is expressed in the final stages of B cell called plasma cells, which is actually the cells that secrete all the antibodies or most of the antibodies in our body. So over there, the CD19 expression is gone and BCMA expression starts. So these two proteins, CD19 and BCMA, are very uniquely expressed proteins in the B cell lineage. And the cancers that come from these B cell lineages then can be targeted through the CD19 and BCMA. And that's why people engineered the single chain variable fragment, the antibody that recognizes CD19 or that recognizes BCMA into the CAR protein. And as we showed some results, it, it, it became very powerful uh, to recognize and kill the cancer. So for the BCMA, uh, by the way, the, the, the proof of concept was again the same, that um, these are CAR T cells are probably the most potent way to go after a cancer cell. And in this category of disease, so in, uh, in the BCMA, we said it comes uh, from plasma cells, which is the end of the B cell lineage. And the cancer that it makes is called multiple myeloma. It's actually uh, pretty common in an in, in, in uh, elder population. And for this disease, interestingly, for the past 10 years, all sorts of different drugs have been developed, small molecules, antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, um, proteins that try to mimic CAR-Ts uh, called bites. These are the newest technologies. So all sorts of different uh, uh, drug technologies were developed for this cancer. And still today, as you can see, the, the, the uh, top uh, publications that came from all of these drugs, responses in when it comes to CAR-T, the car for example, the latest one that is approved. It's just an incredible drug that gives it 97%. That means almost every patient responds to this treatment and close to half of these patients. And this is multiple myeloma where just 10 years ago, the you couldn't live more than a year with these really new drugs. Now you could live for three to five years around. And then with car basically people got cures. Uh, even they were just uh, resistant to all these standard therapies that are out there. So that just shows you the power of CAR T cells, how, how they can be an incredible technology. Okay, well, we talked a lot about good stuff about CAR T cells. So is that it? Then are we done with cancer and we can need to move on to other diseases? And then of course not. Of course the answer is not, uh, is, is that's not correct. And there's still a lot to do even in the CAR T cells. So uh, we showed the figure that they work incredibly. But of course, when we look at, especially in the case of leukemia, that figure, we see that actually people who survive or get cured, which is what we really want to achieve with this, is less than 20% of the people. So it's a it majority response to, although they're resistant to anything else, you get this treatment to respond. So instead of dying in a weeks or months, in the case of leukemia, that's what would happen. At least you would live months to years, so that it was guarantees. But what you would love to have is you get cured of it, and that's still less than 20%. And again, in the lymphomas, 50% uh, of the patient also are not cured. So we can look at that glass from the empty side if you want to. So there's definitely something we can do to increase the potency of these products. The more immediate problem that everybody is focused on is actually these are toxic treatments. I mean, they work great, as we just kept saying, but they're also toxic. And when I mean toxic, like definitely toxic. As you can see, some of the, uh, these are the two BCMA approved products, Carviti and Babecma. And 1% of the patients can just die from this treatment. Now for myeloma, as I said, with the new treatments, you can live for years. Um, and now you get this treatment and 1%, which is, you know, uh, that was the COVID-19, you know, that percentage at some point. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, significant percentage, basically, depending on where you look at it from. But if you look at it from the multiple myeloma patient who's dying from the treatment, who would have normally year, other, years, years otherwise, it's pretty significant. Uh, and besides that, I mean, that's the death part. But 95% of the patients get this what's called cytokine release syndrome, but basically is as these cells, T cells uh, activate, uh, recognize the antigen and start getting activated, they just cannot stop because the chimeric antigen receptor, as we explained in the beginning, is put into the genome of the T cell. So it's always there. That was the purpose, right? So that it can always be there. But the problem is when it gets activated, it also does not know how to stop well because it's man-made. And so we don't do everything perfectly that nature does. So we don't have that fine-tuned uh, regulation. And we put it permanently there. So the cells continue proliferating. It becomes this vicious circle that T cells get activated. They activate more T cells and 
you end up with having high fevers, very low blood pressures, like a very bad, bad flu or COVID, if you will, and then such that some patients may even die from it. The other really unique and weird toxicity is neurotoxicity. So these cells do some weird stuff in brain that people are still trying to understand the mechanism that can lead to stuff like Parkinsonism, uh, which is, I mean, severe and debilitating and long-term. And the percentage for neurotoxicities in general is one quarter of the patient. So it's not small. So this is basically a toxic treatment Treatment. And that's why it's not easy to give everywhere in such a physician's clinic. It, it cannot be given. It needs to be given in hospitals and so forth. Um, and lastly, I mean, uh, one of the biggest problems that people are also dealing with the CAR T cells, immediate problems, is their cost. Um, their current median cost in the FD and the U.S. market is already double than already expensive oncological new generation treatments. They are sold in the median range of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's a one shot treatment. It's great, but not a lot of people can afford that. And uh, it's not uh, surprising that it's this, uh, it's this expensive because, um, I mean, as we said, the cells are collected from the cells. So the patient needs to go somewhere where there needs to be the cell collection procedure. And these cells are now sent into these very well-controlled GMP facilities that are can be sometimes expensive to maintain um, and needs to be engineered in these facilities over a course of a few days. These are all costs, basically. And then at each for each single patient, you need to do this. And then you need to engineer these cells healthy and happy and find a way on dry ice, which is a cold chain that, as we know from COVID vaccines, could be sometimes problematic. Bring it back to the patient can all, uh, all costs and lead to significant costs. So it's not surprising that it's an expensive treatment. Such that the other part is the toxicity. As we talked about it, it can be deathly. So people actually like to monitor these patients in the hospital uh, for a few weeks when they're taking these treatments. And that adds a significant part to the bill, uh, such that in the U.S., uh, the totality of the treatment is uh, over $1 million. And actually, the recommendation is to build Medicare around $2 million per patient. These are numbers that even the United States would not be able to handle. So cost is a big problem. All right, so what is the next generation CAR T cells working on? So there's a lot to do. Um, one is increase the potency, as we said in leukemia, for example, they're still not working. I didn't present any data in solid tumors like lung cancer or breast cancer. Over there, actually, the, the response rates are even much, much less. So they're not working that well in solid tumors at all. Um, can we need to reduce the toxicity? That's actually the immediate problem. And what can we do about that? We need to reduce the manufacturing costs like solid tumors. So um, for the rest of the talk, I'll touch a little bit on the first three. The last point is really a, 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 a seminar by itself. <laughs> so I will skip that point, uh, discussion to some other seminar, but we'll just talk a little bit about the first three. Okay, so these are the products that are currently approved. And here is the chimeric antigen receptor schema of these proteins. So I showed you the general schema of chimeric antigen receptor. And here are the protein names, uh, uh, the proteins that they use for each of those domains. And as you can say, for the CD19, everybody was basically using the same single chain variable fragment called FMC63. And for BCMA, there are two different ones. For transmembrane to anchor it to the membrane, it's either CD8 or CD28. This is what has been tried and uh, some good with some good results, as we showed. And this is what people stuck to. Uh, nobody touched the CD3 zeta. Everybody uses that the same because it, it is the core of the protein, and it's it's it's, it's it, nobody dares to touch that uh, so far. And the costumulatory, as we mentioned, has come actually later into the technology. Uh, the first generation didn't have this, but now there are different options to use CD28 or 41 BB that can lead to some different responses. So there is a lot of engineering to do basically before these proteins. If you start to take each of these proteins and start playing with them. So what I mean by that is for the single chain variable fragment, you can add two of them together. You can link them reverse, backwards, upwards, downwards. And all of these would have different binding specificities and little bit of fine tuning to the target protein and so forth. So that's one part that people are playing with and coming up with new designs. The other part is we said nobody dared to touch the CD3 zeta domain, but there are actually really good proteins in nature, in T cells, that we can use other than CD3 zeta. That gives really good uh, T cell killing and could be much less toxic than this very abrupt 
or strong CD3 signaling. And that's why uh, people are looking in OX40 or CD70 uh, and different proteins to engineer instead of the CD3 Zeta domain. So if we kind of break this, basically the six domains into each piece, as you can see, for each of these pieces, one can play with the amino acid sequences and make the protein more potent, make the cell less toxic, um, and then make the cell be able to work in places that normally T cells don't like work, like in solid tumors and so forth. And as you would imagine, hundreds, if not thousands of paper have come up probably in the past three years, just uh, engineering these different domains and trying to figure out what will be the next generation best car. And lastly, and this is the, uh, the latest uh, crazier technology, just to show you what can be done engineering wise to these kind of things is you can really put these checkpoints now with man-made checkpoints such that if there are two proteins, engineered proteins, and one is CAR and the other one is an inhibitory CAR, so that if the CAR T cell goes to a normal cell accidentally, it recognizes a normal protein and says, ah, wait, 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 this is the wrong cell to kill. Let me not kill this. And then let me go to a CAR T a cancer cell. So these can be done by using the same uh, computer um, uh, checkpoints that we use, like if but <laughs> kind of uh, uh, checkpoints can be used in protein engineering in cells so that they can really be fine-tuned to go after cancer cells and not after normal cells or reduce their activation if they start to go out of control. These are all um, further protein engineering that people are working on that should come up as standard of care technologies perhaps in the next few years. Okay, so we talked about engineering the protein. Um, um, as, as part of where we can really increase potency or reduce um, toxicities. Another thing that people are really focused on engineering is the T cell itself. And there's actually a lot known about this. Um, I put a very oversimplified, uh, oversimplified version of the T cell types in the beginning. We just said CD4 and CD8 cells. There is actually currently more than 50 different types of T cells that are known to work to do certain things better and certain things bad. And people are trying to figure out what is the best T cell to give to a patient so that we can give one shot, it can kill, and it doesn't cause toxicity. And maybe we can do this all by picking the right T cell. So uh, one thing that people went after that is becoming um, really interesting in some products is people used either very aggravated aggressive cells, which is called as T bulk, uh, uh, like bulky, or versus more stem cell type T cells, which are more quiet, but they're smarter, if you will. And when people looked at if there's a difference, if I make a CAR T using this bulk T cell versus the stem cell T cell, what people show that, well, when the first, when you give them to the, in preclinical models at this point, of course, to, uh, to an animal that has cancer, both of them work really well, which you can see with the graph here on the left, uh, denoted as B, where you see that tumor is starting to go down, it's called first response, and the red and the blue are pretty much on top of each other, nicely going down. Now you give the cancer again to this mouse, as if like the cancer relapsed. What the stem cell one can do is respond again, which is uh, again uh, uh, shown with the red, where the leukemia cells are still staying quiet, cannot go up, whereas the blue one is coming up, which means those aggressive, bulky, uh, angry cells are good in first killing, but they don't stick around too much. So you may get a relapse after that. And this is the same car domain, same protein, the only difference is the T cell. And this is, gives you an idea how we can play with the T cells to make the uh, products have a lot better risk benefit ratio. Okay, so the last, uh, I have 10 minutes, uh, good. So the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna uh, touch a little bit upon what are we doing in Cartesian. And one of the ways that we approach the, the technology is that um, instead of using a DNA vector, if we use an RNA vector, so which means it won't be permanently there, it will be there with a half-life like any other drug for a certain period of time, that we can actually engineer. You can engineer cassettes of RNAs that can translate protein for hours versus days. So, and then with this way, we would then have an automatic control over the CAR T cell um, activity, um, such that we can really control the toxicity basically. And our purpose was actually, although I'm a medical oncologist by training, was actually to take CAR T cells outside oncology because as powerful as they are, they're going in the oncology and I showed so many different ways to engineer it. 
it would be awesome if you could use these kind of very powerful selective technologies in other diseases it's like autoimmune diseases, which is becoming one of the most prominent uh, type of diseases is like after, especially after COVID. So why not be able to use these live engineered cells outside oncology where diseases are not immediately fatal, but they're still very debilitating. But with that toxicity that we normally see in the uh, cancer pa patients, it would be impossible to use that in a person who's not doesn't have an immediately fatal disease. So, and this is why we focused on using RNA so that we can control the product better and immediately so that we can take it outside the oncology. So we, this is coined as now as RNA cell therapy and believe as Cartesian, we're leading this because we have four different products that, uh, for uh, three different indications. Um, and the latest one is now up to phase 2B, uh, uh, a clinical trial phase 2B setting. And what RNA cell therapy in essence is basically live cells that are engineered with RNA. And as you heard about RNA from COVID vaccines, they could be very immunogenic. And that was great to do a vaccine, but it's not good to give it by itself for cancer where you don't want that RNA to be immunogenic and eliminated. You want that RNA to stick around and do something <clears throat> for a long time. It would be tough to give it uh, when you just give the RNA by itself. And the cell part of it is, as we kept talking about, the cells are very powerful drugs by themselves that can just do amazing stuff that synthetically made lipid nanoparticles, if you will, won't be able to do. They're not that smart. So this is why using a cell with an RNA made sense to us where we may have very powerful products to go after diseases outside cancer. And again, the basic idea is that <clears throat> RNA would have a half-life, as cells get activated, they wouldn't be able to go out of control and they would, they would be able to do the job, but not do that extensive toxicity. So with that, we built a pipeline. Um, the first one started with Descartes 8, uh, which is actually the first uh, CAR T cell therapy that is ever tried in an autoimmune disease. Uh, this goes back to three years ago. Um, and um, it is the uh, first RNA cell therapy in general in autoimmune disease still today. Um, and um, and um, we learned a lot from that program. Uh, we started that in myasthenia gravis, which is a very typical uh, autoimmune disease that is driven by antibodies. Um, there was a lot of good reasons to go after that disease first. And now we're expanding that program into other autoimmune diseases like lupus, um, um, and pemphigoid and so forth. So um, the program showed for the very first time to the world that you can take a CAR T cell, make it safe and give it in a disease, get really good responses. So a paper is coming up and this is why I can't disclose much in this presentation, but hopefully you will be able to see that in the journal soon um, and get not much toxicity out of it. Um, so with that, we built uh, further products that are all based on transfecting cells with RNA uh, that is more specifically going after lupus. Uh, there's a program that goes after T cell lymphoma. And that's interesting because CAR T cells, uh, nobody has made a CAR T cell against a T cell because that would kill each other, right? Uh, it, it, because the T cell, the, where it comes, is, uh, the cancer, where the cancer comes from is also a T cell. So we're trying to, using the RNA's half-life engineering in a way where it should be able to cancer, kill the cancer cells, but not the other T cells. So, and you can't do that really with the DNA vector. And uh, multiple myeloma is one of the early indications also we started to go after. And here we built a non-T cell program, an allogeneic program, uh, where you can basically, so with the uh, T cell programs, you need to take the cells from that patient and give it back to the same patient. When you say allogeneic, that means a healthy donor cells can be used, which means you can have a pool of drugs in your freezer you don't need um, that you can give to every patient, which is how we normally uh, treat patients with you know, drugs in our pharmacies. So the idea is to do the cells in the same way where they would be placed in pharmacies and you can prescribe and give it to anyone. And that's allogeneic cell programs. And we built one using RNA for Descartes 25. And this is the first um, engineered mesenchymal cells, cells is what the allogeneic cells we're using, uh, therapy in oncology, and uh, it's in phase one. And we're excited about this program. And actually is open also in Turkey, uh, in Ankara, uh, this program. Um, and the last one that... that we are really focused on so let me tell you a little bit about this lead, the one that went to phase two, that we're preparing the publication. What we have done so far is uh, we finished basically the phase one, part one of the trial, where we show that um, you can give billions of CAR T cells engineered and it will be safe and well tolerated. We determined in phase two a an optimal uh, dosing schedule. So nobody has really tried uh, dosing cells in a way 
like using drugs. What is the optimal schedule if there is an RNA half-life, but then the cell lives for a long time. So you need to get some data basically to really understand what would be the optimal dosing schedule. And um, and we've and after uh, treating uh, 12 patients, we realized that the six weekly infusions was really leading to deep and nice durable responses. And that's what now we started recently, a phase 2B placebo control trial, which is the first ever placebo controlled trial in the world uh, for using engineered cell therapies to compare Descartes 8 uh, in myasthenia gravis. And we're very excited about this program, which should complete uh, sometime in 2023. It's Cartesian. Um, one thing that we're really proud is we're still a small team. Uh, all this has been done. So I just talked about my senior program, but as you saw the pipeline, where we're treating different disease indications. And I'm so proud that uh, we were able to do this with our small team that really understood the concept that, um, and so we do everything in house. Um, so we manage, engineer our own CAR T cells, GMP, great. Um, now we do the all the R and D, of course, uh, in house, and more importantly, we do all clinical operations in house. So all this group of people are the ones who are actually making these cells, giving to the patients, following the patients, and so forth. And I'm so proud that uh, they can do that. With that, uh, let me stop. And um, if there are questions about CAR T's, I'm happy to take that. Um, I just want to make a small note there. Here's that um, we do have definitely an um, uh, emphasis now to trying to bring these programs in Turkey. Um, and as I said, there's one program uh, through Cartesian that is open. But if you can contact me, um, um, you know, after this presentation, anytime, uh, there's a lot of avenues that we're seeking uh, to develop uh, engineered cell therapy programs in Turkey. All right. So with that, thank you very much and happy to take questions. Oh, thank, thank you, Metin Hocam, for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, for people, uh, for students, if we see your faces, I will really appreciate unless you are in a compromising situation, then we don't want to see it. Uh, so, okay, so e excellent. So, if, uh, if the floor is open uh, for discussion on the official side, hopefully, then we can turn off the recording and chat a little more, more on officially. We have uh, 15 minutes for question and answers uh, and please raise your hand uh, digitally or type something on the chat and if there is something coming from the YouTube site I am not able to follow it here please uh, or uh, technical assistance should uh, follow that uh, if there are questions there we can just uh, relay it to this one until we have the end of our official recording. Thank you again, Metin uh, Let me lead you by saying uh, that, so the cost is the issue now, right? The, this is, where do you think uh, the eventually the cost reduction is going to come from? And uh, is this, uh, so is this going to be like uh, more uh, centralized facilities or will it be more going towards smaller and smaller clinics in like a, cell conditioning uh, setups in very dedicated applications. So seems to be lots of lots of research going on, but in terms of wide uh, clinical utilization, there seems to be this cost issue, which if it's giving problems in US, I don't wanna even think what is gonna do in Turkey. So. Well, one thing about the cost is, um, it is the reason, main reason is because it's a really novel technology. So what I mean by this, there is very limited amount of equipment, uh, especially up until two, three years ago, available to engineer cells, as you were suggesting, like the ideal would be to have some simple machine in a physician's office that the patients can come and the cells are collected there, you know, with no big deal. And then they leave and the machine kind of does it with not much involvement. You just press a button. So the investment is really just buying the machine and maybe buying a few consumables. And that's kind of the idea where everybody is uh, going to. But to get there, first, you need to make so many manual steps automated. And that's what people are frantically working on to reduce the cost. How can I automate the system more and more using and then I have to say the equipments are really catching up now. Uh, a, a big flood of different companies, Thermo Fisher, Miltani, Lanza, big companies are really invested quite a bit on this and have come up with some really interesting machines in the past few years that automates these things. Now, that's for car -Ts that are out there. For the newly developing car -Ts that I just mentioned, this whole process will be done over and over again. So for people who are doing biomedical engineering or getting degrees on biomedical engineering, there's gonna to be tons of jobs in, I think in the cell engineering therapies 
all the way from discovery, but more so onto process automation, which is a whole new field that nobody knows how to handle or just try, starting to learn how to handle. Thank you very much. I see some questions in the chat. I can read them or the uh, people who can also turn on their microphones and then just ask them. Uh, that, this is Professor uh, Guvenish is asking whether there are any biomarkers that predict the response to a CAR T cell therapy for, as, for specific applications. Because the cost question. an issue, if we can get, uh, select the correct uh, sub-patient, sub-population could be a desirable, I guess. Uh, no, you're sure. absolutely right. That would reduce the cost incredibly. So a uh, few things are being done. So it's, 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 the whole question is, what is the potency assay I can do in this product? That would tell me that this product would work. That's one way to look at biomarker. And the other one is, what is something in the patient that would make the product work in general? So you can look at biomarkers in both ways. For the patient variables, the biomarkers are really limited at this point, and people are still trying to figure out from an autologous T cell program, which one, uh, from a patient's uh, biomarker standpoint, which one really would be able to make us pick the right patient. Now, from product standpoint, though, there's quite a bit of um, uh, assay development done that really looks at like how much interferon gamma a T cell can secrete. Uh, when they engage and target inside the cultured lab the dish. And interestingly, it's actually showing some correlations that it can predict responses. So there's a lot more work on the product side to figure out the potency and really a lot of unknowns on the patient side when it comes to biomarkers. I see. Okay, so there is hope for that. And there is a question from Mehmet Khan Demir. Would you like to ask it or I can just read it if, if you guys excuse my uh, English? So uh, I could, go, I go could ahead, ask. So to find the antigen for T cell T cell activation, how do you how do you do it actually? You are scanning scanning for all the tumor cells and make a DNA library, cDNA library, and find the specific antigen for T cell recognition. Great question. So when it comes to CAR T cells. Uh, we, we said, I mean, to make the CAR T cell technology, it needs to be an antigen that is expressed in tumors of all patients, right? So, so that we can just make the same like CD19 CAR. So as we said, CD19 is expressed exclusively on the B cell lineages. So leukemia from patient A versus patient B, both express CD19, which makes it now CD19 a nice antigen to go after with a CAR T cell. The other part the antigen needs to have as a, um, as, as a future is that it needs to be only on the cancer cell, right? So that's why we said CD19 is exclusive to the B cells so, so, so that we can use it as a target. So people launched onto CD19 knowing this knowledge already, which is CD19 was already used in pathology basically to recognize these cells and how people come up with antigens in pathology is at this point, hundreds of years of work, how each tumor expresses a certain protein that uniquely can be understood um, in, in identifying a cancer. So that's where the CD19 basically comes from, knowing immunology and that kind of um, previous knowledge. Now, what's interesting is, can I come up with a t uh, technology that from that patient, which is what you were suggesting, uh, since we know that, okay, CD19 is present in all B cells, but maybe there are antigens uh, that are present very uniquely on the cancer cell and on for that patient, but it's not present on this patient. So can I also make any CAR T cells, for example, for that? And that's TCR engineered cells. If you remember, I got four categories there for adaptive therapy. And the last one was TCR engineered cells. And that's the idea is there, what again was you were suggesting, which is let's take the tumor, let's do sequencing of all the tumor cells that we have in there, and let's uh, figure out the mutations that they have as compared to normal genome, because that we can do with bioinformatics. And now that we know patient A has this 160 mutations, let's scan its TCR, that patient's TCR, again, using bioinformatics, and figure out if there's a T cell there that can go after these mutated antigens. I mean, it's crazy, crazy amount of bioinformatics, crazy amount of data handling that needs to be done for just one single patient to really figure out is there's a T cell in that patient that can go after cancer such that I can take it out of that person 
and engineer that TCR to now all T cells. Now all T cells will have that TCR. So, and then you, you would get an amazing response. This is all being worked up, um, but it, 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 that part is still in very much in early stages. Um, but for CAR T cells, basically, again, picking the antigen is based on literature, review, knowledge to go for. Let me just look at, you know, and there are many tumor databases that are coming out that the show keeps showing that here is an antigen that is expressed exclusively on tumors. And that's when the CAR T researchers start to go after that antigen, basically. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, I don't see any further questions on this here. Maybe I followed up on the, I didn't realize that there were so many side effects of these CAR T cells. And your approach on the RNA side is very uh, practical. <laughs> and RNA therapy is very popular these days, you know. Now he, so is there any way of uh, an alternative uh, switching on, switching on uh, of mechanisms that can be applied on the DNA side? That was also a very hot topic as far as I recall and turning on of the genes as it, as it required. Is that, is that anything uh, has been tried on CAR-T side? Suggesting that like we do in computer and analogy, there will be if but kind of switches, like if this is a normal cell, don't kill. If this is a cancer cell, kill. So those kind of switches are being engineered, but they are very early on. One thing that got into the later clinical trials at this point is they're engineering a, another protein basically into the car, right? That can be uniquely recognized by an antibody. So I, I, if you can just follow me. So the CAR T cell has this unique protein that is sticking out of the car such that you have an antibody to be able to recognize it, which in, in the case when the cell is going out of control, the plan is to give this antibody infusion so that it should just uh, uh, stop that cell from working because it has that unique antigen that only this antibody can recognize. So technically it shouldn't be touching any other cell, but only to the CAR T cell, only eliminating the CAR T cell. So that's one thing that people have tried, but nobody has, I have not seen still one paper where they said, we built this, it is in the clinical trial, and the patient got toxicity, we gave the drug and it reversed. Nobody has shown that yet. Hypothetically, they put it in there, but nobody was able to, I guess, get it on time or has shown with a few that tried it a really good benefit. But what people have done is, um, just like in the transplant world, so when the first time bone marrow transplants came like 40 years ago, people were dying left and right from the transplant itself. And what got better over time is, how to manage the patients through these toxicities, where of course, like you have better ICUs now, you have a lot more patient care uh, facilities that can uh, take care of a sick patient, basically. So people learned how to do that with the CAR T cell toxicities. When to make that, bring that patient into the ICU early on, when to start the fluids, when do I give the oxygen, when do I give the drugs that can calm down the, uh, uh, the immune system, <laughs> and learned a lot over the past five years, such that a lot of those toxicities are just going down by, uh, by themselves without any more engineering because people are figuring it out how to manage this better. Um, so um, I, the, that death mortality that I presented was from the earlier stages of the trial that is published. But as years to come, I think that will significantly go down just because people will figure out how to manage the toxicities better. Thank you very much. I think we, let's uh, close the official uh, recording part. We leave a little bit for desired for people who cannot join in line. So we will ask very few, very important critical questions now, but after the recording. So if next time, please join it, uh, join the seminars and watch it online because some of the informal discussions at the end are much more fun than the uh, official questions that we ask at the recording. So. Uh, 